Welcome to another episode of the Trusted Advisor podcast and video series powered by the Retail Solutions Providers Association. Our goal on the pod is to accelerate the success of today's and tomorrow's leaders in the retail IT industry. I'm Jim Roddy back with you again. Thank you so much for joining us. Our special guests today are Cord Utz, the CEO of POS Nation in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Will Atkinson, now the Director of Channel Sales at POS Nation, and for the 14 years prior, the President of CAP Software in Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. Hey, Jim. How's it going? Glad to be here. Wonderful. Yeah, glad to have uh, both of you here. So today we're going to cover a handful of subjects over the next 45 minutes or so. And the subjects are both specific to POS Nation, but then also indicative of the greater retail IT channel. So we're going to discuss POS Nation's VARD ISV transition, the 2020 acquisition of CAP Software, and then challenges resellers and ISVs are facing today here in early 2021 as we're recording this. So Court, can you start us off by describing how POS Nation has positioned itself over the years. So you're a reseller, but you're different from the traditional reseller who operates locally or regionally. You provide sales and support nationwide. So to give our audience a background, can you talk about the VAR side of of POS Nation? Sure, and um, as you mentioned, we've been a reseller historically for years, Um, but we've always had a nationwide customer base and really never gone to market or never had a local or or regionally focused go to market strategy. And that really um, is due to just how we generate our leads. Um, We have never had an outside sales rep. We have never had boots on the ground. Um, We've always generated our leads through our website and through our online partners. And then even after those leads become uh, customers, the ongoing support and service is done on a remote basis. So so as you mentioned, we've always uh, had a nationwide customer base. Um, How we position ourselves is really We've always embraced that trusted advisor mindset that local resellers have. And then we've tried to apply that on a nationwide scale. And so for us, that means it really starts in the sales process. You know, you're not just calling a 1-800 number, getting a sales team that's just pushing boxes. You're calling a consultant who's worked with hundreds of businesses in your industry that can really provide a lot of insight into how to get the most out of your point of sale system. Um, And then even beyond that, uh, when you're assigned a customer success manager, that's going to be an individual that works one-on-one with your business. You're going to know them on a first-name basis, and they're going to help you through the onboarding process. They're going to know you. They're going to know your employees. And so it's a consistency whenever you speak to them. And then finally, for ongoing support, it's kind of that same mentality of a high level of customer service, high touch point. Um, So you're not just calling that 1-800 number and getting the guy who just doesn't care. You're calling Eric, you're calling Adam. You know these guys on a first name basis, they know you. And so it's it's a little bit, you know, what we've always embraced is trying to get the best of both worlds, trying to get that high level of customer service that local of ours can provide, yet scaling it on a nationwide uh, basis. Got it. Thank you. And just a couple of clarifying questions, sir, because folks can understand a reseller. They walk in, they look around the, you know, the restaurant, the retail establishment. They do kind of the site survey and then they go and, you know, when they're going to go do the installation, they walk in there and roll up their sleeves and go from there. How do you do those two steps about the site survey? And then how do you do the actual installations? Just so folks understand. Yeah, um, honestly, it's done the, the first part, the site survey. And that's literally the exact phrase we use as well. Um, that's done remotely. And so we're we're calling we're kicking off that relationship and um you know it's something that people are just becoming more and more uh used to and not necessarily due to COVID or 2020 but just um having remote relationships with different business partners the on-site install part obviously that cannot be done remotely um so it's really kind of one of two things we try to get our systems as plug and play as possible so if the customer wants to just go ahead and plug it out themselves it's very simple very easy to use that being said, if we're working with a grocery store or just a, uh, a store that has numerous lanes, um, you know, it's, it's hard to replicate having that on-site assistance. So we use a network of nationwide techs that come in and they have our guys on, on call and they're really just walking them through and they're performing the physical labor there. Um, but that's how we did the on-site installs. Got it. Interesting. Well, thank you for that. Now, that gives our audience a clear picture of POS Nation as of our. Will, can you talk about pre-acquisition, how CAP went to market? So my understanding is company was launched in 1978 as a point of sale and inventory control software. And then over time, you built up your own reseller channel. So can you talk about uh, CAP software and where it was uh, before the POS Nation acquisition? 
Yeah, absolutely. And that goes back to, <clears throat> excuse me, some very different times, you know, pre-internet and pre even really good cell phone connectivity, for example. So we weren't able to talk to people in the same ways. And, and going back to the pre-RSPA days, even we had an inventory control package that started in the, the kind of parts and service business and grew into a full retail management point of sale, inventory control reporting and so on. And one of the initial ways to go to market was trade shows. <clears throat> so we were doing industry specific trade shows, but then if you go back into the mid eighties and the late eighties, there was the Comdex show it was a huge IT show in Vegas and a lot of resellers were there. So, you know, the company was interfacing with end users who came there looking for technology, but also local IT resellers who didn't have, you know, any other way to consume these products. They couldn't find them online. You know, so we were doing physical mailers, but meeting resellers at these trade shows, and it, it became an obvious choice to do, to, to work with and support that local IT channel. And so, with, you know, back at that time, we had on-site annual shows where the guys came to our meetings and did a week of training or several days of training to get that in-depth knowledge so they could be experts in their local market. And that was our strategy for a long time. Got it. And can you go back even further, if my memory serves me right, uh, was it your dad had a boats part company? Is this is what I have in my mind? So you might burst my bubble because it kind of has a romantic story in, in my mind to it. He had a boat, a boat part company, but he wanted to figure out how to manage his inventory better. And so he came up with the software to do that. And so a lot of business owners own boats and came in there and they're like, that's pretty cool. Can you do that for me as well? Am I remembering that again? You might break my heart yeah, here if that's I not. Think maybe nobody used the word cool they thought it was weird but yeah the rest of it's right <laughs> you know they, they he so yeah he had been an engineer and was still an engineer at heart but had been sailing competitively and decided to quit the grind as an engineer and open this sailboat dealership but was still playing with computers at home and this you know this is when they had legs and little orange screens and you wouldn't even recognize them as a computer today you know certainly your cell phone is a hundred times more powerful or ten thousand times more powerful but uh, as he was trying to manage this business, you know, you can imagine it's like going into an auto parts store. Now you look behind the counter and there's just racks and racks of parts and pieces and they all have inscrutable part numbers or no part numbers. And so he had developed an inventory control system for himself. And then, as you say, when business owners were coming in to buy a boat, they would come to need, you know, buy parts for their boat and he would turn and, you know, tap away on this crazy computer. And that was so foreign that people had just generated a conversation and he got a lot of questions and feedback and decided to package it up and make it a little bit more consumer friendly and set it just for him. And so it grew from there, you know, into that boat parts business and then to other kinds of things. And then the actual register portion came from that. Yeah, fabulous. Love love hearing the roots and almost the uh, accidental entrepreneur, you know, path uh, that it took there. So, all right, so let's talk about the acquisition. I'm excited to talk to you guys about this because I've heard from a lot of people, talk with a lot of people about acquisitions that are happening with other organizations. We get to talk about the two principals who are really involved in that. So, Court, just really want to start off with why did this acquisition happen and get your perspective and then get Will's. Sure. Um, really, for us, it started with a, a challenge that I guess every entrepreneur faces at some point in time is you identify a problem and then you say there has to be a better way. And for us, the problem was one of the key components of what we were selling, the POS software, was really entirely out of our control. So we were relying on a third party to develop it, to continue to develop it, to add the features that merchants were asking for. And we're a very entrepreneurial focused company. And so you know, what goes along with that is you want to be in control. You really want to control your own destiny. And relying so heavily on a third party was just something that didn't sit well with us. That, that was always a constant frustration. Um, on top of that, you know, just given our business model, we talk to thousands of merchants on a monthly basis. And we really feel like we have a great sense of what the market is asking for, what features are rolling out, what the competitors are doing. And so we always felt like we just had a ton of knowledge. We just, there's no way to use it. We, we couldn't apply it to a software. And look, what I'm telling you, probably every VAR um, has always thought about, they've always sat around and said, man, wouldn't it be cool one day if we owned our own software? Like, like that's not unique. Um, and it was some a conversation we had over beers on Friday for years. And then probably around 2019, we were kind of getting a little bit larger. And, you know, one day we said, you know, guys, we're to the point where we can actually make this happen. This isn't just a pipe dream. This isn't just pie in the sky. And kind of once we realized that, then it became, oh, this is a nice to have to, guys, we have to do this if we're going to take the business to the next level. 
like we're doing good, we have a good trajectory, but to get to where we want to go, this is just something we have to do. And honestly, that's kind of where Will comes into place. And did you consider building on your own? Like, why don't we roll out our own stuff or why don't we just do all this stuff? Was that a consideration? Abs absolutely. The, the buy versus build question is, you know, that's not specific to our industry. That's, that's any acquisition. I think you're going to ask yourself that. Um, I'm an informer investment banker. I come from the finance world. I worked in private equity. Um, I know nothing about coding um, or knew nothing about coding. So we did consider it, but just given my background, my strengths, it was a very easy decision to go the acquisition route instead. Got it. Well, thank you for that. So we'll talk about your perspective on the why and then you know, add some of your color in terms of how the acquisition transpired. Like how did it get from you know, an idea that Cord had to actually moving down the path and actually happening? For sure. So we obviously came at it from completely the other side. We've been our own software development company for a long time and had been targeting resellers and and the frustration there is that we're always dealing with the merchant at third hand. You know, we're not getting that direct feedback necessarily on the software that a sales team like POS Nations does. So we had to always be filtering, like, where do we go with the software? Do we read the trade publications and just do what the market says we should do? Do we listen to this one loud customer or this one reseller? Or do we do panels? You know, there, there's all these pitfalls and ways you could just go down a blind alley and end up with a bunch of features that nobody wants. And so getting that direct feedback was always something we looked at and, and we did try some of those things and struggle with it a little bit. And uh, and so that was always on my plate, you know, just weed out the chaff and do we, you know, where do we go with the software? But then sales as well, you know, chasing a third party channel is challenging. You know, it's always something that we have to stay on top of what our partners need. How do we get more partners in given areas? And then how do we make sure we're helping our partners compete with the larger incumbents, you know, as a smaller company these days, that was one of the bigger reasons as well. You know, we just looked at the writing on the wall with the acquisition, you know, sort of just momentum we've seen the last several years and the idea of being a small traditional player competing with multi-billion dollar international companies is daunting. You know, we just didn't like that idea so much. So then the idea of being part of a little bit bigger organization, having some more muscle to grow sales, having some better input on the software, and then have a little bit more muscle to fund development growth, you know, so that we can actually implement all those features people ask us for, instead of saying, well, we'll get to that in three months or six months, or all things that were on my same thing, you know, Friday night wish list, like when the day is done, what are the things that I'm trying to solve for for the bigger picture for the company long term that we need to do better or we need to figure out how we're going to address and so you know going to the specifics of the acquisition you know court and i've known each other for six seven years something like that and and so we've always talked at shows like the retail now show and yeah as he said in august of 2019 we're in san antonio down by the riverwalk and uh, i think we're probably in the same room as you right at that time jim and <laughs> and we started talking about it he said you know we've kind of been talking about doing some kind of some kind of something you know some kind of merger some kind of partnership and i said yeah you know that's kind of on our roadmap too but we don't really know what that looks like and i think that's about as far as it went at that time and then he reached out to me a week or two later and we had a few just casual chats and then it it just every time we talked it made a little bit more sense you know the st strategically it's just been a home run and it was from day one you know, all the things that we were trying to address and the things that POS Nation wanted to achieve all lined up. You know, we never hit that big, oh man, how are we gonna make this integrate question? You know, we just never hit that roadblock. So and I think we both kept waiting for that. You know, we're gonna have a call where one of us is gonna raise an objection, the other one's gonna groan and say, geez, this doesn't make sense. And we just yeah. it just kept clicking. So here we are. So so feel free to laugh at this, and this is I mean, all analogies fall down somewhere, but I think a lot of folks think from an acquisition standpoint, a whole bunch of people in suits and lawyers and all this formal stuff at a conference table. This almost sounds like a, I want to say a date, but like, are you interested in selling? Because we might be interested in buying, right? It almost seems like it's an innocent that way, but you know, that's kind of how it starts off with just one thing. Like, Court, did you go into that Retail Now show in 2019 saying, I'm going to talk to Will about this, or was it just some, I'm going to talk to a whole bunch of people about this? Yeah, it's, it's very organic. I mean, in any acquisition, you have to plant a lot of seeds and, you know, it may be years later and then some actually comes to fruition. So there was no, for us at least, there was no targeted, I'm going to go seek out Will. Like you said, we've known each other for years. We always tend to kind of end up hanging out at, at the Retail Now show and um, it, it just kind of, I don't want to say blossomed, but but yeah, it was just like the seed was planted and it kind of grew. And 
for your dating analogy, honestly, I think um, like a, a few days have passed. I was back in Charlotte and I actually texted Will. So it was very, you know, it was very much like a dating scenario. And I was like, hey, what, what about this? And I'm just kind of sitting there waiting for him to text me back, you know, getting the butterflies in the stomach. Um, so, yeah, so that's a great analogy. Um, but this, you're exactly right. Everybody thinks it's Wall Street suits, lawyers, bankers, and these things can happen organically. Um, and anybody can do them. So, so I think your analogy is spot on. And how important for both of you, I guess, court first and then will, was cultural fit? You know, a lot of times when I hear about mergers and acquisitions, people talk about the dollars and cents and the audience and the product and all that. But it seems like the more that I talk to folks, that's really secondary. And the fact that you guys got along with each other, understood each other, and could be comfortable actually working in a true partnership with each other, and then your organizations as well. It seems like if that didn't mesh, like that's almost where you have to start. Am I understanding that uh, correct? Like that's really step number one. Absolutely. You, you cannot overstate the importance of cultural fit. Um, and, and that, you know, from an, in, if you're inexperienced to m and you just, you're gonna look at what makes sense on paper. And yeah, of course it has to make sense on paper, but, but I think my experience in the banking world and seeing various acquisitions, some work, some not work, you realize just how paramount a cultural fit is and making sure everybody's rolling the boat in the same direction that 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 exists and so you're 100 right that is criteria one two and three after you realize that it makes sense on paper and that's where we were just so immediately comfortable with working with will and his team because we had known them we had worked with them before you know we had that long-standing relationship uh they saw the world the same way we saw the world and so that just you know, overcame innumerable obstacles and barriers that could have presented themselves, you, you know, weren't an issue just because of that cultural fit. And Court, let me ask you this, or I'm sorry, uh, Will, let me ask uh, you this. So um, one lesson that I learned from a business mentor of mine was he said, there's no room in business for nostalgia, right? So you can't say, well, this is how things were, and that's how I always hope they can be. But was there any part of this, if you don't mind me asking, we talked about your dad starting the business and going back to 1978, and you're president of the business that you're like, man, like this is, I'm like selling of the the baby right like something that we really created really like almost a family heirloom and selling it to somebody else can you talk about that aspect at all or are you going to tell me just to grab a tissue suck it up like that's not really how we work in the business world were there any parts of that that went into making this uh, a little difficult to navigate through uh, as you move forward that it wasn't just a, a dollars and cents and culture fit thing i'm coming across really cold and heartless here jim you know i should have put on this, <laughs> after this you know my banker outfit uh, that's all true, you know, I mean, and I think going back to the dating analogy, you know, we, we look at values and what we appreciate when you look at a partnership, because, yeah, I mean, we did the initial kind of, what is the size of this deal, the, the very high level numbers, does it make sense, you know, is it even doable? And then once we hit that kind of hurdle, then we said, okay, where, where do we both want to go? And that was the strategic side, and it kept clicking but then it came down to the are we comfortable with each other's values and i literally asked court some of those dating questions you know we talk about books we like to read and what do you want to do you know next like what is your personal value system because if he had said oh i want to be a you know corporate raider or i always want to be growing this business forever be like oh boring you know just this it's not you know it's not going to be fun to work with a group like that but that's not been the case and it wasn't the case a year ago so, you know, but you do have to divorce yourself from that nostalgia, you know, letting history get in the way of progress. And that's so cliche, it hurts, but it's just, you know, those things are all things we value, you know, the history and the stories and the relationships. But to say we can't do this thing that's going to benefit all the people that work at CAP and potentially all the people that work at POS Nation and let us all build a new success story together that we can look back fondly on in the future because we hold closely this story from 1985 is not the right way to go about it. You know, and it, it's not to say that doing this thing is destroying the past or burning down the legacy. You know, it's put, writing a new chapter in the story. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, a new chapter in the story might be different ownership structure, but we're we're moving on and adapting with the times and you've adapted since 1978, right? And so this is just another, another adaptation uh, with that. Um, and so, Court, let me ask you this. So um, another analogy, this isn't a dating one, but I, so when I've talked with resellers, you know, like you said about if they only are locked totally into one ISV, that they're essentially on their railroad tracks, right? And wherever that ISV is laying down the track, 
that's where they're going. Now, that could be great because the track gets laid down exactly where you want to go. It takes you to new places you couldn't get there on your own, and that's fantastic. But again, you're on that railroad track. You can't really steer off of it. With your own software, you're kind of driving on a highway. And so you can choose wherever you want to go, and then it becomes how good is your company, how good is your software, is just like how good is your car? Is it a jalopy or is it a you know high-performing Tesla? And so is that, again, feel free to poke fun at that analogy as well, but do you is that kind of how you see it as well? Like, hey, now we are in way more control of what we're doing, and we really like this vehicle that we have, so we can leave whenever we want, we can stop whenever we want, speed up, things like that. Is that, uh, I guess... What are your thoughts on that analogy? Is that kind of the, the thought process behind it? Yeah, I mean, let's start, take a step back to when we were a VAR um, exclusively. We always debated with, all right, do we put all of our chips in one basket with one ISV um, or do we spread, you know, diversify? And, okay, if we go with one, then we can get really good at that software and there's a lot of advantages to that, but then you have a lot of concentration risk. If we spread out and we offer multiple softwares, okay, we're diversified. But now our tech team has to support five different softwares and they just can't go as deep. And so that was always a challenge for us. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, going back to what you said, now that we have that ISV arm and controlling our own destiny, you know, one of the things that Will and I agreed on very early on, this was one of the first questions we asked is, you know, what's the vision of the software? And do we want to try to be a generic software that's great for everybody? And neither one of us saw a great future with that. And we were both very hyper-focused on let's being the best software for our niche industry verticals that we can be. And if that means we have to leave some opportunities on the side, you know, ignore those shiny objects, then so be it. Um, but we're able to control that. And so we don't have to go worry about developing features that are going to serve markets that, that aren't important to us. We can just focus on our niches and, you know, ignore all the distractions and get right on that highway and keep going, as you just said. And and what are those niches like? Because sometimes people only focus on one really narrow thing. And so if you can paint a picture for our audience, like what niches uh, are you focusing on? Yep, to steal a uh, term from 2020, um, we coincidentally um, have always focused on essential businesses. Um, so that is inventory centric retailers. Uh, so it's liquor stores, it's convenience stores, groceries, markets, hardware stores, um, businesses like that we're very good at. Um, again, it starts with the sales team. They're their experience selling to those guys. They, they know how they operate. They can provide advice. They can be consultants. Then it trickles down to the support team. They've helped 100 liquor stores and 20 today alone. So they're very familiar and versed with the industry challenges. Got it. Thank you. And to tie uh, into your point of where you said earlier about as a VAR, you're kind of at the mercy of your vendors. Uh, I remember this is a few years back and I talked to one reseller and they said, my top three vendors are Mercury, Micros, and uh, dinerware, I believe, was the third one. And all three of those got acquired in the same year and all sorts of difference and changes. And so yeah, you kind of have to roll with that as a, as a VAR. But if you've got your own software and, and all that, you, uh, you're, you're in more control of that. So a um, couple other questions before we take a quick break. I'm curious from a communication standpoint. So first, Will, your perspective, how did you announce this to your team how did you roll this out was it something that you it was almost like a jack-in-the-box like this thing just happened or did you let them know <laughs> as it was going down uh the path how do you communicate with the team when you're going through this kind of change in this acquisition you know as a small company but i think it's probably true for even somewhat larger companies i don't know about a thousand person company but you know transparency is important for me i think as a culture you know letting the team know what's going on with the business and that doesn't mean sharing every financial penny you know secret every week but letting people know what we're doing what's on the horizon is important so once the discussions became pretty serious between me and court and we started talking about just logistics of vetting the software and customer references and things like that so i just involved some of the key stakeholders here and said guys here's what is happening here's what we're talking about nothing's done yet but we're not selling to a wall street firm that's going to fire everybody and, and just go take the software off and put it online somewhere. You know, this is a strategic goal and partnership and try to, you know, there's a whole lot of small, slow explanations, you know, just so there were no jack in the box moments, because as you say, you know, everybody has that Wall Street vision of a big company buying the small company, stripping the assets, sending everybody home and, and everybody being out of work. And that's not what happened. And that's not what we intended to happen. So we had zero job loss as a result of this acquisition. And so, you know, that's something that we wanted to make sure everybody understood 
day one and before day one, because even if it didn't happen, if it was a surprise, people have that in the back of their mind. You know, we'd spend the first month just calming fears and explaining ourselves when if I had done some of that prep work ahead of time, it just made it a lot smoother in the month one, you know, in the first month. Not to say that it was easy, but it just makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, so it seems like your main communication was from a safety standpoint in terms of we're not looking to have all sorts of redundant resources. Like people here, it's great synergy, and they're like, oh, that means they don't need two of whatever, right? And so they take those terms, and that's what it sounded like you were really trying to communicate in terms of here's how this fits and accelerates as opposed to a way for just gaining efficiencies. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think making people understand not only the business reasons, but the human reasons and some of those partnership reasons for the, the acquisition was key to getting everybody on board from day one. Great. And then, Cord, can you talk about your communication with your team and then also with your customers? And if you've changed now how you communicate from a go to market standpoint uh, or, you know, have different tactics because you're a different company, essentially. Yeah, correct. So, you know, let's start with the early stages. When we were going through diligence, uh, very similar to Will, we were a very transparent company. Um, and so we got a lot of the key uh, key employees involved in that diligence process. Um, you know, I'm, Will, I'm thinking we flew um, one guy down just to kind of sit with your team for a while in Fort Worth uh, for a week and to take notes. And so I think I'd be naive if I were to think that word wasn't getting out to the, uh, you, know, you know, across the, the employee base. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of guys were involved with this decision. It was not like me just sitting up in my office scheming. Um, and so it involved a lot of people. Ultimately, though, we announced it to the team um, at um, one of our quarterly meetings, which is a really important component of what we do. Um, and, you know, again, I think a lot of people knew. And if they didn't know, they saw the writing on the wall. And they certainly knew the challenges of being a reseller that I've already discussed. So it probably wasn't an enormous surprise to anybody. Um, it was something that we had talked about for, for years and years, as I've already alluded to. Um, in terms of communicating for our customer base, um, we actually kept the, the CAP software brand and the POS Nation brand separate for the first eight or nine months um, of the acquisition. And so we maintained two brands, two websites um, that, as you can imagine, led to a lot of administrative just hassle and ultimately uh, consolidated, I think, in August, late August of 2020 so one and that was really the first time that we made an official announcement um and so like i had people emailing me saying congrats and i was like well we did this about a year ago <laughs> but um, you know right. nonetheless i appreciate it um and so now you know the cap software website now redirects to pos nation and so in terms of how we communicate with customers we say is it's like this is an advantage for all the reasons i just listed that we wanted to do this acquisition you'll now benefit from that um and so it's been perceived very well um, really on both sides, um, uh, you know, the CAP customers, they had a lot of advantages too. They have now have access to a much broader help desk, uh, just more resources uh, for the reseller, for uh, the CAP resellers. Uh, again, just access to more marketing materials, access to more assistance and uh, the onboarding and support process. So, so no issues really that we've seen whatsoever from the customers, from the resellers or any of the stakeholders really. Got it. And just one point and then another question for you, Court, before we uh, take a quick break. Um, you know, a book that uh, was first introduced to me many years ago by uh, Mark Olson, uh, retired from APG Cashflow, was a great game of business. And it talked about teaching your employees how the business works and really sharing with them all the challenges and, and things of that nature. Oftentimes leaders think, and I think you will, you alluded to it like, oh my gosh, the word might get out, right? Like somebody thinks of those things and they fear sometimes telling their employees so they under communicate. But I guess everything I've bumped into over the many years that I've been you know, involved in the business world is over communicating is so much more beneficial where you get everybody not just getting buy-in because that almost sounds like twisting their arm, but just sharing with them what you're going through as you're going through it again maybe not sharing every single detail but i guess court can you talk about that in terms of how important was that to make this seem to make it more seamless not just seem more seamless can you talk about that that the over communication is better than under communicating and trying to keep things secret yeah you know as i said we weren't doing or communicating every specific detail every step of the diligence process but thematically we knew this was the direction we wanted to take we knew the challenges and so once we decided that getting input from every department, from every employee, you know, I think that does lead to a lot of, again, to use that phrase, buy-in. And so that the guys feel like 
this is not just a job, but they're actually contributing to the company and they're making a, they're moving the needle with the company. And you know, that made the whole process easier because don't get me wrong, combining two companies is a lot of work and it is a lot of frustration. E even if it looks easy and, and even if it goes smoothly, there's days where you're just frustrated and it's, it's tiring. And so if you are forcing that on people, that's tough. But when people kind of embrace the notion that, hey, I helped contribute to this, you know, I'm a reason that we did this because I brought these issues up and now we're resolving them, that kind of makes those frustrating days, those challenging days of integration go, go a little bit smoother. Yeah, behind the uh, press releases and the ribbon cutting and the smiling is a heck of a lot of work and hair pulling <laughs> exactly. uh, that goes into any, acqui any acquisition. So, well, let's pause here for a moment to let our listeners and viewers know that an RSP membership has never been more valuable or affordable. Annual memberships for VARS start at just $250 a year for dozens of high value services, including access to a legal advisor, a security advisor, and a VAR and ISV business advisor, exclusive e-learning programs through the RSP Academy, discounts on business services, and a college scholarship program program for the families of RSP members. Vendors and software developers benefit from an RSP membership as well through introductions to VAR and ISV members and by showcasing their solutions through the exclusive RSPA Solution Center. Accelerate your success by joining the RSPA today. Also, thanks to our sponsors who support the RSP community and make this podcast and video series possible. Our platinum sponsors are Blue Star and Shift4 Payments. Our gold sponsors are Heartland and ScanSource. To receive the benefits of an RSP membership or RSP sponsorship, email membership at gorspa.org. Finally, don't forget to save the date for Retail Now 2021. That's July 25th through 27th in Nashville. Retail Now is where the industry meets and also where acquisitions uh, start taking place, <laughs> uh, apparently as well. So, um, all right, so let's talk about a little bit more in general our channel. I want to spend a few minutes there. So what are the challenges ahead for your organization in 2021 and beyond as an ISV har, var and as, as an ISV and VAR hybrid? And talking about ISV har, VAR hybrids in uh, general, because we're starting to see a, a lot more of those. So Court, if you want to take that first. Sure. And, you know, some of the challenges, and I'll speak of it from the angle of we were a VAR for a very long time. And so instead of external challenges, I'll talk about the challenges of working, um, you know, an ISV VAR hybrid working with their partners, working with their resellers. And so we were a VAR for a long time. And so we can appreciate and felt firsthand some of those frustrations that, that any relationship is going to encounter. And so some of the frustrating aspects of working with a third party ISV. And so we're trying to remember those and we're trying to alleviate those going forward. So, you know, two of the most common ones that we ran into um, were when we were a, when we would work with other hybrid uh, ISV VARs, we always felt like our customers were second priority. That the, uh, the hybrid, you know, their customers that were being sold from the direct sales channel were more profitable. They got first in line uh, when something went wrong and they needed help. And so we always just felt you know, is a step back. And so we're trying to, to not do that, obviously. We're trying to treat all of our customers equally, um, whether they were generated from our reseller channel or our direct sales channel. Um, and then I think the second, and this is an obvious one, but the second challenge um, in working with those relationships is, um, you know, respecting, avoiding that, that um, conflict of interest. We have a direct sales team, we know that. And then the resellers are going out and selling as well. And so avoiding that conflict of interest, um, honoring what the resellers bring to a table. So if you know, we are somehow came across the same lead, you know, honoring um, the resellers right to have that. And so that's always tricky. And you know, we run into situations that of course we can't envision. But again, I think we come from it from a different angle because we, we were VARs for so long and we understand those challenges and felt them firsthand. And so we're just trying to, take that empathy that and push that mentality down with uh, when we're working with our channel. Got it. Thank you for that. And so, Will, uh, what challenges do you see? Because you're an ISV, and I'm guessing one of them is all the marketing that other ISVs are doing, these these giant ones. So what do you see as the challenges for ISVs going forward and then the challenges for VARs going forward? Because you've dealt with a wide variety of them uh, as part of your channel over the years. How do you see it from a broader standpoint in the retail IT channel? Yeah, the challenge for ISV is really the same as it has been for the last five to seven years, but just turned up to 11. You know, it's we've seen so much consolidation. We've seen so much interest from new players in the payments and banking space. 
and these mega acquisitions. So, you know, the competitors that we talk about, you know, that you may have asked me about 10 or 15 years ago at a retail now show, you know, who, who you come across in the marketplace, it's an entirely different ecosystem of competitors and it's no longer, you know, the, the channel partner that has three developers and 15 support guys, you know, it's some global company that has bought 15 or 20 software companies in the last two years alone. And so how do we compete with that? I mean, how does an ISV get heard in that marketing noise when the global is spending, you know, $20 million a month on Google ads? You know, we're obviously we're not going to do that. And so, you know, so that goes back to Court's point about specialization. You know, do we just try to be the number one search word for retail? Absolutely not. You know, that can't be our strategy. So we just need to be found where we want to be and be providing things like better service, you know, just being a, a top line, easy to find ISV is really only half the battle. You know, customers, especially channel partners, aren't going to stay with a cut of partner like that if they're not a good partner. You know, just having the brand name gets your foot in the door as a VAR. You know, if you can bring a product that's one of the global, you know, household names. But if merchants don't like it, you know, if they get bad reviews or if they just can't see that it's easy to use for their staff, they're not going to stay. So, you know, for, for ISVs, it's really sticking to your values and making sure that you're producing products and services that do enable the VAR mission, you know, because you're not going to win marketing against the, the big guys. You know, it's not going to happen. You're not going to have the cheapest thing. Everybody's giving it away for free. So instead of trying to be free and everywhere, be affordable and be good at what you do and provide that value to the VAR so they can go provide their value to their merchants. Got it. Thank you. Court, your take on challenges for ISVs and for VARs in our industry going forward. Sure, you know, I, th I think Will outlined the, the challenges for small ISVs uh, very well, um, you know, and it goes back to focusing on our niches where we're, you know, if we think we're going to outdevelop and outmarket, you know, the squares of the world, we're delusional, so we, we focus on, on what we're good at. You know, from the VAR perspective, um, I think it starts with lead generation, honestly, um, I think is a big challenge. Um, and yeah, you may come across leads, uh, but those leads are going to be more competitive because people are more and more used to just shopping online for B2B software. Um, you know, there's been there's been hundreds and thousands of SaaS startups in the in the B2B space, and they're all the same model where you have a centralized sales team and a centralized support team. So that's just becoming more and more prevalent, which means every lead you encounter is going to be that much more competitive. And so, how do you differentiate yourself? Um, I also think a big challenge with with VARs. Um, when they are competing is if you're still on the, the nine to five business um, kind of lifestyle business, you, you know, that's dead, that's gone. That's forget about it. Um, Jim, on a lot of your podcast, you've had um, uh, people talk about, you know, businesses now 24, seven, 365. And if you're not willing to embrace that, and if you're not willing to go tackle that, I promise you somebody is. And so you're going to be left behind. And so it's, you know, how do you get in front of people? And then once you do, how do you compete against them? Um, it, it, when it's so competitive and ultimately it's, I think it's the answer's twofold. It's embracing that kind of 24, seven, 365 mentality, and then finding how to, a way to differentiate yourself. And ultimately for a lot of ours, it goes back to that, what I said at the very beginning, that high level of, of customer service, that high touch point, and that's just the best way to, to do it. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's no doubt a challenge. Um, there's no, you know, no way around it to, um, it is it's tough, but it's doable. It's certainly doable. Yeah. yeah, it's a challenge, but the days of the territory dealership where these things are just naturally going to flow right in and I'm just filling orders, it's, it's completely different. It's more like swimming with a bunch of piranhas, right? Because you have so many other, so much other competition there. And so some of the things I was taking notes is, as both of you were talking, it almost seems like if you're a VAR or an ISV, ab avoid being a commodity, right? If you're getting beaten out by commodity players, then you've got to change your game and to change your game to being more niche. And that ties in with the differentiation from a niche, from a product, from a service standpoint, I guess, did I, was I hearing accurately? Is that, uh, um, yeah, that is that how you guys see it? Well, yeah, that is definitely the way I see it. I would just, I would throw price in there. You know, when you say commodity, what we really mean is price, right? <clears throat> you know, if the customer can't tell the difference between your product and somebody else's, then they're going to go buy the cheapest one. And, you know, as Court said, if, if we're trying to compete on price, we've already lost. And so is a small bar, medium-sized bar. You know, there is someone that's willing to do it cheaper than you or for free, and they'll make money somewhere else on the back end. So do not play that game of just trying to be another Me Too product that sounds 
flashy but doesn't have any substance and do it really cheap because you know you don't have the scale to do that so find that niche use your knowledge use your service capabilities to differentiate for your local market got it great stuff so just a couple more questions for you so this acquisition so was you know when you talk about uh, on the range of tactical moves and strategic moves like this was all strategy and so a lot of ms uh, smbs don't take the time to analyze and reshape their strategy for the future they tend to show up every day and just keep working harder and harder and harder so i guess first starting with you court and then will like what one or two actions do you recommend to the vars and isvs in our audience in terms of how to ensure that they have the best go forward strategy for their organization how do you make sure you're balancing that day to day but then also serving the future needs of the organization and making good strategic decisions so again court first on that it is a challenge not to get lost in the weeds on a day-to-day -day basis, no doubt about it. Um, one thing that really helped us is, um, and I'm going to steal some um, from uh, the book Traction, because I have, as assuming you're about to ask me for a book recommendation, so um, I'm going to go ahead and plug that. But um, years ago, five years ago, we literally wrote down goals on the wall, and we said, where do we want the company to be in three years? And some of the goals were lofty, and we had no earthly idea how we were really going to get there. But it was the mentality of let's put it on the board, let's announce it to the company, and then we'll go figure it out. And, um, you, you know, you, you kind of work backwards from there. So, okay, if I want to be there in three years, where do I need to be by the end of the year? And if I want to be at, at here by the end of the year, where do I need to be by the end of the quarter? And you get break it down into chunks. And then, you know, again, it's written on the wall, it's announced to the company base, you review it on a weekly, monthly basis. And so, that has always helped us, no matter how deep into the weeds we get on a daily basis, kind of keep the long-term vision at the forefront and always being remembered that that's where we're working towards. Um, and because otherwise it is tough not to just get stuck in your inbox for a whole week at a time, but just always have that long-term goal, have it visible uh, literally and, and figuratively so that you're always trying to make progress towards that. Um, and so that's the best bit of advice I can offer. Yeah, and Traction also has check-in points. So it's not like just put it up on the whiteboard and cross your fingers and hope that it comes true, <laughs> yeah. but check-ins to see are you actually making making progress on it. You need to do that. Uh, Will, uh, what, how do you, what do you recommend to our audience in terms of making sure they have a good strategy and they're adjusting the strategy for what their business needs? So I'm sure you've heard this one, but one of my first mentors said, you know, you've got to spend some time working on the business, not just in the business. Because, uh, you know, as you run around putting out fires, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, whatever your, your workload is, you're not doing anything about tomorrow. You know, you're just doing something about what happened today. And if we live reactively and we're not solving for any of those future needs, and you know, you mentioned check-ins, but as a smaller company, you know, you may not have the stakeholders in place that court did, you know, with that management team and whiteboarding. So you got to hold yourself accountable. You know, it comes down to accountability. Who is making these decisions and when are we going to do that? Or when am I going to do that? So it could be as simple as a calendar reminder, but you have to let yourself, you know, give yourself that discipline to say, I'm not going to go read that one more customer complaint email at six o'clock on Monday night. You know, this is the Monday night I put on my calendar that I'm going to spend an hour deciding what our end of year goals need to be. And I'm going to give myself the ability to do that. You know, I'm giving myself a free pass on that customer ticket or whatever it is. But if you just say, no, I've, I've got, you know, that's hard. I'm busy. I'm going to go solve these, you know, problems in a minute, then it never gets done. So I think, you know, personal accountability and just being rigid with that even if it seems like you're letting your day-to-day -day responsibilities lapse, it, that's more important to have those goals and have timeline on it and some kind of accountability. And it could be as simple as asking, you know, somebody else in the business that is not your manager, owner, you know, to say, hey, remind me on Friday morning that I'm supposed to go to lunch and think about this thing and write it down and ask me if I did it. You know, just something, mm -hmm. just something stupid like that, but having some kind of accountability system for yourself to do those things instead of just living in the minutia because it's satisfying to do go put out fires all day you feel like you did stuff sure. you know, i'm busy i'm doing a good job but you're not you know as an owner you know visionary you're not being you know putting a lot of vision into the business if you're just reacting yeah and, and oftentimes and, business oh go ahead court i was going to say when we you know we literally put on the board we wanted to complete an acquisition and so that's like you said that's pretty daunting that's hard to conceptualize as such a big project and so we broke it down to like look by the end of the month i'm going to have a list of 10 potential targets and then i'm going to present them to you and then we put that on the calendar and then you know the next month i'm gonna have 10 more then the next month i'm going to have called five of these people and so just breaking it down step by step and then as will said making sure someone on your team is holding you accountable to that um, really helped us just chip away at such a large and daunting project 
Yeah. And I think a lot of people see business as, you know, success. It's a lot of genius, like, oh, this genius and magic and stuff like that. It's a small part genius, but a big discipline, discipline, discipline. I think Jim Collins, the author, says it. Rigorous discipline. That's what separates the good companies from the great companies. The great ones have have that rigorous discipline. And so, yeah, Court, you're right. So you're obviously a listener of our podcast. We love asking our guests our final question. Can you recommend to our audience a book to read, an online resource to follow, a podcast to listen to besides the trusted advisor uh, that would help them improve their organization? So Court, you mentioned traction. Any other resources you wanted to share uh, with yeah. our listeners? Absolutely. Um, Will and I were talking about this yesterday. We were saying we're probably going to get asked this. So, um, you know, I, I know you've said Traction is, I think, the most recommended book on your list. I've heard you say that before. So I'm going to try to offer a different angle. Um, I will plug one blog uh, real quick. I think someone's done this before on your podcast as well, but Reforming Retail by Jordan Thaler. He has somehow managed to make point of sale systems edgy and add sex appeal to the point of sale industry, which is, is pretty challenging, <laughs> but uh, that's always an interesting read. But um, for my recommendation, I'm gonna take an entirely different angle because you've had a lot of people recommend a lot of great books. Um, so mine's gonna be more from a leadership perspective. Um, I think when we're faced not only with day-to-day -day challenges, but especially like macro challenges that we saw in 2020, um, you know, it can be daunting and it can be overwhelming. And for me to help stay grounded, to help stay, remember that like, okay, this is, I can overcome this is I love reading about historical leaders and, um, you know, how people have overcome challenges in the past. So I'm a big history nerd. Um, the Civil War is probably my favorite era. So I'm going to plug Killer Angels uh, by Michael uh, Shara, or Shara, excuse me. Um, it's a kind of a historical fiction book, but you really see the Civil War through the eyes of uh, the leaders on both sides. And again, it kind of grounds you and you take a step back and you say, okay, you know, if those guys can overcome that, then we can overcome 2020, then we can overcome this customer fire. And it really kind of helps set the mindset right. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you shared that and talk about a historical podcast, a blog post that's actually already scheduled to drop, and it's going to drop about the same time as this podcast, is Leadership in Turbulent Times by Doris Kearns Goodwin. And so I read that, and it looks at, um, you know, four presidents, I won't get to all the, the details, but about how they led during their own individual crises and times of change, hugely applicable to any sort of leadership situation. So yeah, there's a lot that we can learn from, from history. We just don't have to look at our at our own industry. So got it. Okay, Killer Angels. Uh, Will, uh, what do you recommend for our audience? Oh, um, well, so he, we kind of shared that one. So <laughs> I didn't have really a separate Will one. Will thought I was joking when I said it yesterday. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, it's because it's the same thing. I mean, you know, we, we talk about leadership and it's, if we restrict ourselves to leaders in the point of sale industry, I think we're missing the boat. You know, it's, it's great leadership doesn't have anything to do with the topic. You know, how, it's how are we inspiring people or how are we addressing problems in a sane way? And uh, and so, you know, I, the other one, you know, that I that we joked about was if you read about George Patton, you know, just the pragmatic way, you know, and it's you can take good and bad lessons from that, you know, not being so maybe gruff and over, you know, running over your employees. But but the, in, you know, inspirational side, you know, and being forceful and sticking to a very specific discipline set of tasks and saying guys this is the important thing and you guys can do it we're going to do it together and this is how we're going to do it but not getting off in the weeds with the details you know as a leader necessarily yeah i was looking on the bookshelf behind me it was uh like you're talking about history and some military things i think it's the art of war if i'm remembering that like that has a lot in there in terms of how to compete not just in a military you know battlefield setting but just in general yep Good. Great recommendations, gentlemen. Well, that does it for this episode of The Trusted Advisor. We hope you enjoyed our discussion. If you did, be sure to subscribe to the RSPA YouTube channel and The Trusted Advisor podcast so you never miss an episode. We'd also appreciate it if you'd rate us wherever you find your favorite podcast. My personal philosophy is the more stars, the better. And if you'd like to learn more best practices for VARs and ISVs in the retail technology industry, you can check out the RSPA blog. You can find it at gorspa.org and then clicking on RSPA blog. Before we go, big thanks 
once again to Court and Will for sharing their wisdom with us today. Gentlemen, I really appreciated the frank conversation you had uh, about the acquisition. Thanks also to RSP Marketing Manager Chris Arnold for his production work, Joseph McDade for our music, and last but not least, thanks so much to you for listening. Our goal at the RSPA is to accelerate the success of our members in the point of sale ecosystem by providing knowledge and connections. For more information, please visit our website at gorspa.org. Thanks for listening and goodbye, everybody.